So welcome, Alex. Becky, thank you very much um, for the great introduction and the invite. And uh, thank you all for having me. I'm very excited for the opportunity to share with you some of the uh, work that we have done uh, that uh, really comes out not only of the campfire, our ongoing effort, uh, but also the previous uh, reconstructions we have done over the uh, past almost 20 years uh, in collaboration with uh, CAL FIRE and other um, partners and uh, uh, state agencies uh, all around the country. So uh, we're having some technical difficulties uh, today. That's why, regrettably, you cannot see me. And we're going to use the um, um, PDF instead of the PowerPoint. Um, uh, I think there must be some uh, uh, real um, challenges uh, with uh, the networks uh, across the nation. I'm on the East Coast, and um, uh, we'll make it work. So the um, the main focus today is on um, the escape report. Um, this is really the um, how to report uh, from all the lessons learned from the campfire. Uh, the campfire study uh, to date is over a thousand pages long. And we know that this is way too much information, way too much of a commitment from eight, from uh, four HJs to, uh, to dive in and uh, really pick through all of this. So we have put together this report uh, evacuation and shelter and considerations, assessment, planning, and execution, essentially as a guide to help um, small and intermediate size um, intermixed communities uh, with uh, their notification and evacuation plan. So we want to learn from uh, uh, previous studies. I think that's really um, uh, the only way forward. Our in-depth studies are um, you know, very expensive. It's a federal commitment, uh, many, many years, tens of thousands of hours of work per study. And we want to make sure that uh, these they are leveraged and uh, we make the information available to, to the public. Uh, so what we're going to um, really focus on is understanding the timing associated with these evacuations and the fire uh, as the fire comes in the communities uh, with the ultimate risk to manage life safety. Uh, we Right, you're going to see, uh, we're going to talk about the evacuation triangle, which is, you know, similar in concept to the fire triangle that many of you already know about, but it's it's really a new thing. Uh, and then uh, we're going to uh, point you to uh, really consider doing some drills in your community. I'm just giving you some high level stuff here um, to help you get your bearings on exactly what's going to take um, to enhance uh, life safety of your community, not only residents, but also the first responders. And it's absolutely essential to be prepared because the main thing that we're going to talk about here, uh, the essence of, of this work is zero notification events. Uh, next, Becky, please. So uh, let's look at the outline. Uh, we're going to talk about why was escape developed? What is the problem? You can see on the right here, uh, a sneak peek at the evacuation triangle, why we fires and evacuations are different from other disasters. And as first responders, I think it is very important uh, to appreciate those differences. We're going to look at exist existing practices, evacuation failures, and there we're going to divide evacuation failures, subdivide them into two different uh, categories. And then we're going to look at uh, paths forward to address these evacuation failures explicitly. Um, and after that, we're going to dive into the spatio-temporal relationship between fire and evacuation. You're going to see how things sink in time and space and why we're having the problems we're having. Uh, then we're going to offer you the proposed approach and highlight implementation assessment, planning, and, execu and execution. Pardon me. And uh, I also want to um, let you know a, a couple of things before we dive further into the presentation. Uh, I mentioned it to Becky. Uh, if uh, you all want hard copies of the escape report, please let Becky know and we can send a package uh, as we get these things printed. And secondly, over the next uh, uh, six months, we're gonna be uh, building a tool online to help uh, uh, facilitate the um, 
transfer of knowledge that is in escape to make it even easier for HJs to um, use those principles that are outlined. And next, please. So why was escape developed? Um, we have a significant uh, number of lessons learned from the camp fire case study. As I mentioned, this is a very extensive case study. Uh, the uh, last report we released, Camp 4, which is on notification, evacuation, traffic, and TRAs is nominally 500 pages long. Uh, and we have a, a very high density of data, spatiotemporal, that is allowing us to understand this large event in, in a truly an unprecedented way. So ESCAPE is a methodology as I mentioned, for small inter and intermediate size intermix communities to help them, uh, to help you develop um, and implement, and implement, I want to stress that, notification and evacuation plans, uh, to help you understand why the methodology or the, the guide, if you will, uh, and I'm using those terms loosely and interchangeably, it is developed the way it is. We have included in ESCAPE 24 examples from the campfire study that you can follow through and see the rationale behind uh, the proposed decision and the proposed plan. Uh, next, please. So uh, what is the problem? Uh, the problem is uh, we have a life safety risk when there is insufficient time to evacuate um, civilians out of a community. Uh, and uh, civilians, and in, in many cases, as we saw in the campfire, first responders get caught in burnovers. Uh, and um, we saw the need for temporary refuge areas. Um, to give you a sense, uh, TRAs, uh, and in this case, TRAs, we use the term broadly, though the things are further defined in the report, but um, there were 31 TRAs used uh, um, at the campfire. So this is not something that happened once or twice. Uh, and uh, we learned a lot and I'll share some of this with you. Uh, furthermore, what we have done here is um, this is the methodology is designed to address the needs of existing communities within the constraints of the built environment and uh, what can be done within the evacuation uh, networks that are available and, and so on and so forth. So. Um, there are some serious challenges uh, that we have uh, seen, and uh, I'm sure many of you know uh, intimately well. So we're going to go through methodically and build it up, take it apart, and then come up with some uh, uh, paths forward. Next, please. So what we have seen from the camp is that there is, um, as the fire moves and progresses from ignition, uh, and moves to one or multiple communities, uh, there is a connection between the fire progression and the notification. So initially, so if you look at the uh, graph on the figure uh, on the left, uh, between the two vertical bars, uh, vertical lines, initially the notification lags behind the fire and it takes some time for the system to catch up and have the notification be at the same time as the fire and ultimately get ahead of it. Uh, we have the data and we understand this uh, quite well. They do vary from incident to incident, but the important thing is to understand that these relations do exist and there are finite timing components that we're gonna cover uh, later on to help you make sense of things because it, even in best case situations, things don't happen instantaneously. Uh, and that's where we're gonna want you to conduct drills in your community to collect some of that key information to, to help you set up your decision-making beforehand. Uh, next, please. So uh, from 30,000 feet, when we look at TRAs and wildfire safety zones, uh, in the case of camp, there we pull them all together. And for the purpose of this going forward, I'm going to use the term TRAs. There are significant uh, differences 
Uh, a lot of nuances. We're working with the U.S. Fire Administration on some national level definitions. Um, but the uh, if you look at the TRAs, there were two uses. One is was to address the immediate threat to life safety, uh, essentially make sure that people that are caught in burnovers get out of burnovers, or um, well, people that were all right on the edge make sure they didn't get into burnovers. Uh, burnover situation. And the other one was to manage the evacuation civilian um, flow. So two very different uses, but ultimately both uh, next page. Uh, while we're waiting for the screen to change, uh, I will uh, point. Okay, all right, great. So, uh, presentation outline. First, we're going to cover where we are now, and then we're going to uh, specifically look at how to go forward using the lessons learned from the camp, both for existing communities and also uh, use those lessons to help us better design uh, new communities as well as. All right, let's uh, go ahead um, and uh, keep going to the so now we're starting a new section. Uh, why we evacuations are different from other disasters. Uh, one of the fundamental differences is that uh, we events are self-propagating. Uh, that doesn't happen in other disasters. Uh, an earthquake that hits a community doesn't make the community generate more earthquakes. Um, uh, hurricane. Uh, in, a, in many ways, a hurricane is the exact opposite. When a hurricane hits a community, it decreases in intensity. Here, the energy that drives the disaster is the fuel. It's uh, the fuel that drives the disaster is the asset we're trying to protect. So uh, these events are self-propagating, and this completely changes uh, how we think uh, about them compared to other um, uh, disasters. You know, uh, and for some of you that may be um, uh, near the coast, and you may be dealing with, um, as an example, with uh, tsunamis. Tsunamis don't make tsunamis. Uh, you know, when a tsunami hits a community, it doesn't create new tsunamis. But here, the fire starts fire. Uh, and that really you know, not only changes the dynamics, but also we can end up with this hopscotching, where the fire jumps ahead and then backfills, and you're going to see the impacts of that. Um, next, please. So why are evacuation? Why are we evacuations different than other large-scale evacuations? So let's uh, briefly talk um, about where where we typically are before uh, an ignition occurs. Typically, we have fire weather watches, and we might have red flag warnings. Uh, but those warnings and those watches do not indicate that there's a fire. Right? They just say that the conditions are right, but there's those will not tell you if a fire ignites and where a fire will ignite, uh, which is completely opposite from the way we think of, let's say, uh, in this case, hurricanes. Uh, hurricanes, watches, and warnings are issued using a standardized national system. Once a hurricane track is in place, we know we have, we know there's a hurricane. We know that we're going to have lead time in many cases of days, if not uh, many days, and there is a national decision support system uh, to help with the evacuation. We don't have any of this for fire. In many cases, mo mo most of this stuff doesn't apply because it's a completely different animal. So uh, this builds up next to the point that we have to think about these events very, very differently. So um, a, a little bit more on this, but again, to help Further make the case, um, 
in uh, if we look at the North Atlantic, um, in 2020, we had 30 named storms. The 30-year average is 15, and not all of them hit land and require evacuation. By contrast, if you look at uh, the NIFSI data for 2021, we have uh, 50, almost 59,000 wildland fires. Now, not all of them hit communities, but we don't even know how many hit communities. There's no way to keep track. We don't have standardized metrics for any of this uh, quite yet. So uh, it is a challenge. Um, and a lot of this is contained uh, by this. I mean, the wild, the wildland fires, uh, which is not the case, obviously, with hurricanes. We do not stop those. Uh, next, please. So you can see that this is a different animal. Um, now, uh, I hope you appreciated the comparison with uh, some of the other disasters, but even within fire, evacuations are a different animal from evacuating a commercial building or, let's say, a university campus. Because the impacts can be uh, anywhere from community all the way to regional scale. Uh, and if you're evacuating a building, that's not going to impact your original traffic flow. Um, if you're evacuating a campus, uh, the impact can be contained um, and you can make provisions uh, for that in a more streamlined way because the scenarios are much more contained as we'll talk about. Uh, the community gets uh, very challenging uh, to manage. And this is particularly important because while we, if you look at a building, a commercial building, we have standards for number of egress arteries. In this case, in that case, you know, doorways and stairways and all of that. This is all uh, standardized and it has been for years. We are not there at the community level. Uh, and this becomes uh, problematic with very fast moving fires that can originate very near the community. Um, and essentially turn these events into zero notification events, almost like a tornado. Uh, next, please. Uh, we also, I should mention uh, that we don't have any standards for fire shelters. Uh, we have standards for tornado shelters, but we don't have standards for fire shelters. So uh, as we'll talk about in a little bit, uh, the option of staying or being in a building it doesn't by default give us the performance that we would expect from some other um, uh, shelters that we may use in other disasters. Uh, the uh, point of this slide is to say that uh, we can experience civilian evacuation challenges. And by challenges, I mean situations where people get entrapped or require assistance, whether they are in their residence, whether they're at work, whether they're at school. Uh, and schools are particularly a challenge if you have a limited number of uh, buses compared to the total capacity of the school. And of course, uh, care facilities and uh, hospitals. So this impacts the entire community uh, and the timing and the sequencing of how to deal with this is gonna be extremely important. Next, please. Uh, I, I made a note there. Uh, to look at Camp 4 for the almost 200 identified rescues that occurred in Paradise, uh, I mean, during the campfire. And I encourage you to um, look at the report uh, and, and um, certainly participate in our NIST WUI days on November 1st, uh, 8th and 15th, where we're going to cover uh, the Camp 4 uh, in uh, detail, uh, among other things. So uh, there are... Uh, almost 20 challenges. Uh, I know it's a lot of stuff on the page here, but I will go ahead and read them because I, I do want to go through every one of them and then we'll, we'll keep going. Large number of possible fire scenarios. Uh, you can appreciate why. I'm not going to read uh, everything uh, there. Chaotic behavior uh, in which small perturbations of variables can result in large changes in predicted event. Uh, let me decipher it. This is a spot fire occurs three miles ahead, closes an egress artery. Small perturbation, significant impact. Uh, number three, difficulty in characterizing, quantifying, and analyzing the large number of different fire scenarios. I'm not going to say they're quite infinite, but there are a very large number of scenarios with very large number of outcomes. There are number four, complexities of modeling um, the whole thing and predicting fire behavior specifically. 
difficulties of how to account for the uncertainties in the methods used to generate the different scenarios, uh, difficulties in how to use and implement these findings. Yeah, you can create a thousand scenarios. What does it all mean? Even if you understand the uncertainties, which as you'll see, will be very large. I uh, need to characterize and quantify the possibility of non-containment. And uh, this is the, I think this is an opportunity for science, but we're not quite there yet under what conditions we don't, we, we should expect a non-containment. And this is not just the weather, you know, that, in, that is gonna include number of available resources, accessibility and so on and so forth. Uh, next slide, Becky, please. Uh, these are all still before the fire, need to develop contingencies for events like loss of communication and power. And we saw the impacts of that um, in paradise. I need to develop contingencies for potential closures or obstructions of egress arteries. You'll hear some of that, some pretty dramatic um, artery closures that occurred. I need to evaluate the evacuation to high hazard wildland areas, um, which may result in burnovers. Uh, that's very important because just telling people to get out of the community, uh, that, you know, in many ways is the easy thing. Uh, you know, you pull the, how we're going to get them to safety. Uh, we need to make sure we understand the entire pathway. I need to develop evacuation plans that address all the above issues. And we need to communicate all of these plans to the first responders and the public. So you can see, this is our this is a real tough nut to crack, uh, and that's why we created Escape to help simplify and enable decision makers uh, to create a structured plan and, and uh, um, understand how to enhance life safety in some of these very difficult situations. Uh, next, please. During the fire, uh, limits in situational awareness, which I'm sure all of you know, including dynamic outages. Uh, in data sources and communications, uh, you know, in in paradise, and the and the um, and this is not unique in paradise, but just giving you examples, uh, the uh, community EOC had to be evacuated, and um, nine or one dispatch, so the police station had to be evacuated, uh, and that created significant discontinuities in communication and operations, uh, integration of rapidly changing conditions uh, into the ongoing evacuation activities. So the, the feedback loop um, there, a large uncertainty in fire spread during instance. And lastly, communication to first responders and civilians of any changes to the evacuation plan during the evacuation. So you can see that uh, th there's there are a lot of real challenges here. Next, and now let's talk about fire. Um, so existing practices and current research, uh, there is a strong emphasis in the early out, ready, set, go uh, type of programs, and that is great. And uh, this is, uh, I'm going to say, obviously, where we want to be. Uh, but regrettably, there are situations that we know will occur where that will not be an option um, because there will simply not be enough time uh, to get people out of safety. So staying uh, some jurisdictions recommend stay and defend. I want to point out here that there is no standardized way to determine what is defensible, including by whom and with what equipment and under what conditions. Um, and you'll see some more of that in a couple of slides. Uh, some jurisdictions recommend shelter in place uh, or shelter in community in wildfire safety zones. Uh, there are no standards for fire shelters or wildland fire safety zones. Uh, so. Uh, we we will work towards um, uh, the guidance to help with temporary fire refuge areas, which is not the same as safety zones. Um, but uh, you can see that uh, we are at the early stages of this, and the, the, the problem is already upon us, so we need to take some action. Next, Becky, please. So civilians stay and defend. Uh, this can be very dangerous. Uh, if you look at the table, uh, a civilian and a firefighter are not the same thing. Uh, the training, the stamina, the communication, the equipment, the availability of a team, um, the experience, uh, these things just are not there. Uh, and uh, 
Furthermore, uh, exposure sources from adjacent building, adjacent parcels, pardon me, uh, are beyond the control of residents. They, they cannot uh, they cannot control those exposures. Um, they cannot control the that will generate those exposures, and typically beyond their ability to suppress them. You see a picture here uh, from the campfire. This is a parcel fully involved: um, vegetation, a truck, and a house. Uh, and a neighbor right next door, as, in, as you know, in California, in many places, the uh, neighbors can be as close as six feet. But even if you're 10, 15 feet away uh, with a garden hose, th there is no way uh, you can you can do this safely. Um, you, you can protect uh, your property in those conditions and you can put your life at risk um, if you even have water. So uh, th this has to be dealt with very, very carefully. Uh, we have no standards for any of this, and uh, I can tell you first from first-hand experience um, when we're invited uh, uh, to help with the Australian Black Saturday fires. Um, uh, you know, we saw people that uh, we saw. Uh, 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 destroyed structures where people perished uh, with their uh, families in those structures when they could have uh, walked 50 yards to an open field and and they would have uh, they would have survived so uh, staying and staying and defending um, those have to be dealt with very very carefully and there is a lot of knowledge that is missing to enable us to 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 make uh, those um, to inform the public uh, in a in, in a safe manner so to speak next please um, so what are the consequences of uh, this uh, missing link? And by missing link here, uh, we're talking about uh, what we do when there isn't enough time to evacuate. Civilian perish in their homes, as I mentioned, uh, about Australia as an example, and then civilian perish in their vehicles as they try to, to evacuate. So we need to address evacuation scenarios where there is insufficient time to evacuate from the community. And the main thing, uh, I want you to take away from this slide is we need to manage life safety risk and manage is the key word because we're not comparing the ready set go to what we do when there is no time these are two completely different scenarios and this scenario where there is no time we don't want this to be an afterthought this is not um something that we think about during the event this has to all be laid out beforehand it has to be communicated to the community it has to be rehearsed with the community so that everybody understands what they need to do when there is time to evacuate and what they need to do when there isn't enough time to evacuate uh, next please so why is it so hard to reliably um, predict evacuations uh, we have a series i'm going to call the modules here and these blocks and they are linked or in some cases coupled. Um, in, for, as an example, fire and uh, weather for fire behavior and weather forecasting, that's coupled because they feed each other. But uh, you can see that there are many steps before you get to the upper right in terms of civilian evacuation. Uh, and every time you try to model one of those modules, you introduce uncertainty, even if you know the scenarios, but it gets even more difficult when you really don't un, don't up, know the scenarios and then you end up with literally thousands of scenarios and you it's analysis by paralysis you don't know what's going to happen uh so it's easy to make situations up it's hard to understand how you're going to use this knowledge uh, to, to create a plan uh so the uh compounded uncertainties is really something that i want you to uh, take away from this uh because it's not really something that is broadly documented by many of the um, uh, people that uh, uh, work in this space. And it is very, very important to, to appreciate that this is extremely difficult to do. Uh, next. So uh, there are essentially, uh, we, you can look at this flow chart at, at your leisure as part of your um, slide deck. But if we go from ignition, uh, there are, uh, a couple of scenarios here that, that, that we can uh, go through to determine uh, how things are going to play out. So in, in the dark gray box, we have the detection and situational as assessment. And then we have two outcomes. Either the fire is contained uh, outside of the community 
or the fire is uncontained, uncontrolled with the potential to impact the community. So then it spreads and either it affects evacuations or it can miss the community and not affect evacuations. That's the one part. But once we're in the gray box, the other part is the decision making to order the evacuation. First responders and the public of the evacuation orders and then trip the public evacuation. So you can see that we can have situations where we can evacuate with no fire or we can evacuate uh, with fire uh, and we can evacuate uh, with fire that impacts us or not. And we'll flush this out in the next few slides. Next, please. So to help us better understand how to tackle this, let's look at failures. Next. So we have divided failures into two types. Uh, type one failures are undesirable, undesirable evacuation consequences that do not impact life safety. These are not to be diminished uh, or neglected because they do affect the overall community perspective on evacuations, but this is very different from the type two evacuation failures that actually impact life safety. Next. So type one. Um, so we have prolonged evacuation out of the community. Uh, and this can be a situation where uh, the community uh, doesn't get um, by fire or um, people are out uh, and it just takes a, a very uh, long time. But the, the, if you look at the without fire situation more explicitly, uh, there is an economic impact to the evacuation. Uh, and uh, I don't want to diminish the economic impact, but also there can be evacuation fatigue, which will then build the resistance to evacuate in future events. So um, I'm not saying don't evacuate. All I'm saying is this is what we're seeing in terms of failures, and we need to address them. Next. So how are we going to address them? Um, improving fire spread predictions uh, using local knowledge and tested modeling, and tested is a very important component, and then we can talk about that in the future um, after this presentation, if anyone wants more information on that. Uh, that can add value, improving evacuation time estimates. I think that's absolutely essential, and I'm going to put a lot of weight on drills. We need full scale community evacuation drills. And as you will see, this is an important part um, to help us build the evacuation timeline. There are two parts uh, to these drills, and we're going to talk about that in a few slides. Economic modeling can help us inform uh, about the impact uh, of uh, an evacuation to the community, and that can be used to help inform the community and lastly here, social component and public education. We really need to engage the public and let them understand why, uh, in some cases, we need to evacuate, pull the trigger, uh, evacuate early. Um, and in some cases, the fire may miss the community. And that is preferable than having people caught um, in, in a burnover. So the timing, the fire progression, evacuation, Coupling all of this stuff is something that has uh, to get to the public in a concise and readily uh, in uh, in a ready to absorb way, so to speak. And our escape tool that we're working on will help with that. But we're this is part of a much much broader national effort that's needed on this fund, and we're working with several collaborators on that. Um, next. So type two, this is now where uh, things uh, impact life safety. We have higher fire exposures and those can occur at residences or during evacuation. Uh, what causes these things? It can be an ability to effectively communicate evacuation orders to residents in a timely fashion. You know, the fire starts right on, on the edge and it hits the community before uh, even situational awareness um, uh, and the decision uh, are, are all in place. Uh, fire ignition near community uh, is, is uh, uh, an example here. Uh, underestimating uh, the fire spread rate, underestimating the time it takes to evacuate, and then underestimating the impact of fire on egress arteries. So you can see uh, there are a lot of scenarios here that can get us to this bad spot. Uh, next. 
So uh, let's dive in a little bit more uh, as to what causes uh, civilians to experience high exposures. So uh, number one, uh, we can have situations where the civilians simply cannot evacuate. And there can be um, physical or medical factors. There can, there can be lack of transportation. They're stuck at home. They cannot get away. Um, so that's something that needs to be addressed. And we'll talk about that. High exposures at one's residence after they made a decision to stay. So let's say that whether they're prepared or unprepared, they've made the decision to stay and then the fire catches up with them and now they are in trouble in their home. Uh, and if that is the case, uh, let, let's say that they've made the decision to stay, but at some point uh, the fire hasn't reached their home, at some point they decide to leave, uh, they can get um, hit by fire on the way out. Um, or they can get hit by fire on the way out, even if they uh, started leaving when they were told to leave. Um, so there are a number of situations here and that can result in these types of high exposures. Uh, next, please. So um, civilians that are unable to evacuate owing to mobility impairments or lack of transportation, uh, we can break this further into two sub categories. One, where we have enough time to evacuate uh, before the fire hits the location, and the other one where there isn't. Next. So if we take this apart now, let's see how we can address it. The easiest part is um, when there is enough time. That's the category A. Uh, implementation of special needs evacuation programs can help you get there. The second part, category B, uh, is really the hardest nut to crack. And that is when we don't have um, enough time. And uh, the example on the right um, from the camp shows you two scenarios. Uh, I'm going to dive into them in a sec, but let me first go through the category B. Fires may uh, rapidly restrict access to the area by first responders or for first responders. Fire and smoke may slow down evacuations and the uh, traffic uh, may be directed out of the area using counter, counter flow um, to increase capacity, making it, the ingress of first responders difficult and dangerous. So if we look at the figure on the right, um, there are two scenarios in paradise that I want us to look at. Um, scenario C, which is um, the rightmost one, is uh, what happened near Feather River Hospital and the evacuate the um, um, facility over there, uh, retirement home. And uh, this was right at the edge of the community. So the fire came from the right. Uh, very early on, uh, there was a very um, pronounced, uh, aggressive and comprehensive response to evacuate, uh, I believe it was 140 people, uh, and then the hospital uh, very successfully. Um, if we look at example B, uh, that didn't exactly pan out the same way. Um, this was further in the community. There was a request done early on. Uh, I want to say at 1030, if I remember correctly, I, I can't really see the screen. It's too, it's too small uh, here, but you, you, you can read it on your slide deck. Um, uh, there was a request to evacuate uh, early on. Uh, the evacuation didn't occur until much later and uh, the fire um, actually uh, caught the building, ignited the um, uh, nursing home, uh, the critical care facility on fire uh, while the evacuation was taking place and the building was ultimately destroyed. Uh, so uh, it was cutting it very close. Um, so this is something that really needs to be factored in, and it's it, it's not an easy thing to do. We acknowledge that. Uh, next, please. So what do we do about it? Well, there are a couple of things we can do. One is uh, to harden the care facilities and buildings uh, requiring evacuation uh, considerations, uh, including certain residences. Now, uh, the idea here is, and we have a methodology, the hazard mitigation methodology, uh, to help with that. But I want to be very explicit that even hardening a building uh, doesn't turn a building into a fire shelter, all right? 
so uh, there's a continuum between uh, non-hardened to hardened to fire shelter. And hardened is in the right direction. You can prolong, but the current codes and standards are not sufficient uh, to, to get us there. And uh, I'll show you two examples. Uh, on the upper part is um, the Feather River Hospital in Paradise on Fire. And on the bottom is one of our structural separation experiments we did. Uh, the uh, target, the building on the right, um, is uh, California WUI Chapter 7A compliant structure. Uh, the source term is uh, um, uh, under 120 square foot uh, unregulated shed um, five feet away. And so this complies with the zero to five foot um, zone are, you know, that uh, came out of the Bureau of Forestry with no fuel. In this case, the best case scenario, no fuel, and the hardened home still catches on fire. So uh, there is work that needs to be done. If we're talking about hardening, we really should be looking at HMM, which is way more comprehensive than the um, uh, Chapter 7A. But even that is not a fire shelter. Uh, HMM may um, prevent ignition if fully uh, followed, uh, but that's not going to deal with power requirements, ventilation requirements, and all sorts of other uh, accessibility and other considerations uh, that may be involved uh, with uh, building a fire shelter. And as I mentioned, we don't have standards for fire shelters. But this is something we need to be considering uh, for situations where it's very difficult uh, to get everyone out in a timely fashion. And uh, th this is some hardening that absolutely needs to be part of our evacuation uh, assessment. Next, please. So um, high exposures at residence, enhanced life safety is what we want to get to. Uh, we want to educate the public. Ready, set, go. We need to get this more broadly uh, communicated. And we need to make sure that the community understands that uh, these events can be zero notification events and that they need to listen to the um, HJs uh, and follow uh, instructions because it can uh, really be uh, the difference between between life and death. Uh, next, please. So uh, high exposures, burnover conditions during egress arteries. Uh, so what can we do there? Where we can clean up the arteries. Uh, easier said than done. Um, this can be very expensive. It can involve multiple jurisdictions to get the clearances, the setbacks that are necessary. And this is something that has to be maintained. So it's very expensive. Uh, next, please. So another approach is to use a distributed wildfire safety zone system, or uh, depending on how you want to um, look at this, uh, temporary fire refuge area. Not the same things, but the, uh, the main thing is distributed uh, to enable people to get there, limit their travel, and manage the exposures. Next. So let's look at how this thing's time, space, and time to get a better sense of the evolution of these events. So uh, the, there are many parts, uh, there are many steps that are involved in the evacuation continuum uh, from, this, from ignition all the way to um, getting people out to safety. Uh, and there are different ways to write these equations. Uh, but I want we have uh, restructured uh, in this way. Uh, so ignition to safety can be subdivided into two main blocks: ignition to activation and evacuation time. So ignition to activation involves includes everything from uh, the first observation, situational assessment, decision making. an activation of notification system. And then people get out. So uh, we encourage you to run drills. The first part, all the way to 
getting the public to get out, you can run in multiple um, conditions and time how long it takes for the system to work. And I can tell you it is not instantaneous. And it is very important to understand this number. So uh, just for the purposes of uh, this uh, presentation, uh, we're going to hypothetically create this ignition to activation uh, number. Uh, let's say we run drills and we have this down to 20 minutes just for discussion purposes. And then for, again, discussion purposes, we'll say we've run drills and we can evacuate 98% of the community in an hour and 40 minutes. So the ignition to safety is two hours. So keep this in mind. Next. And we'll come back to that here uh, in a little bit. Uh, sorry for the slide. Um, it's supposed to be animated in the PowerPoint, but uh, the point I want to make here is that there is a relationship between uh, the ignition location and the impact to community. And this is obvious, but uh, how it plays out is actually counterintuitive uh, in many ways, because uh, if the ignition occurs very close, which is the upper uh, figure, yes, you're going to get, uh, the fire is going to get to the community very quickly, but the local impact of that fire is going to be relatively small because the fire will not have had time to grow. The scenario underneath uh, is what we call the sweet spot scenario. And unfortunately, this is exactly what happened at the campfire uh, down to the T. The ignition was far enough away uh, where there was some additional time, not a lot of time, but additional time. But at the same time, when it hit the community, it hit the community broadside across the entire width of the community, causing a very dramatic impact on that community. Uh, the one that is hidden underneath uh, is better from an evacuation perspective because it gives you more time. The entire community is still impacted, like uh, scenario number two, but you have a little bit more time to communicate the information and, and, and deal with it. So. Um, understanding those relationships is very important, and that's part of the proposed methodology to help us tie all this together and create a path forward for decision making. Uh, next, please. So uh, what we see here is uh, uh, you've seen the plot on the right before uh, notification lags the fire and notifications ahead of the fire. And on the left here, we have uh, fire notification scenarios, and we show how FN1 all the way to FN5, uh, uh, how in so many of these scenarios, you can end up in burnovers. And that's what we're going to look at next, exactly when these burnovers can occur and how this can impact how we think about the temporary fire refuge areas. Next, please. Uh, sorry about this again, <laughs> without the PowerPoint, this is all animated, but um, we have, uh, let me just read through the list. Uh, this is not ideal, but let me just read through it since we cannot do the animation. So in shelter in place, um, we can have a situation where we defend the structure and property, preparations are in place and life uh, safety is not impacted because it doesn't hit, the fire doesn't hit. Um, scenario B is inadequate preparation. Uh, and scenario C is we end up with an entrapment. Uh, and that entrapment can occur uh, in scenario B uh, as well. Uh, E2, we can become entrapped during evacuation to the safety zone. Um, E3, we evacuate to the safety zone. E4, we can become entrapped during evacuation from the fire area. Uh, and E5, we safely egress. So you can see that as you go out, there are many opportunities to, to get in trouble. Uh, so we have to understand the sequencing and the spacing uh, and the timing to get, you know, for traveling. Next. So this is a very, um, it has worked out in terms of communicating to you. Uh, we have three areas during the campfire um, that experience very different uh, events. 
so uh, at the top of the screen, Concar rescue area, community evacuation uh, started when the fire arrived. So this is really a worst case scenario. In the middle in paradise, a part of the community evacuated before the fire arrived. Um, and then at the bottom, uh, Highway 32, all of the all of the of, pardon me, all of the community evacuated before the fire. And here you see the coupling that we talked about earlier: fire before notification, notification in parallel, and then a notification gets ahead of the fire, and we can flush people out, get them out uh, before the fire hits. Uh, next. So. If we look at the side, I'm not going to look at the whole, uh, I'm not going to read the whole table. Obviously, here, I encourage you to study it. But we have this continuum. Uh, the green here is uh, the early out, which is what we want. Uh, the red is people getting uh, trapped and burned. And then we have uh, the uh, TRA, which is orange because it depends on the uh, conditions. And then uh, shelter, uh, stay and defend, uh, really, and in buildings varies depending on the local conditions. So it's it's uh, great. Uh, but there are a lot of nuances, and uh, there's a lot in that table I encourage you to read next. So uh, getting to the wildfire safety zone. Uh, this is an example in, pa in uh, Concow during the um, campfire where evacuees uh, were trapped in multiple burnovers on the way to the wildfire safety zone. And in this case, the wildfire safety zone, uh, this is a picture uh, we took months after, uh, they had to wait until the fire burned the fuel on it before they had access to it, and the, the people that got there early. So uh, we need and those relationships and what this points to is in very uh, high fuel areas, even short distances uh, can become very problematic. Next, uh, in terms of travel. Uh, and this is a great a series of examples to read. So um, this is a start uh, slide. Uh, it is an important one because it highlights uh, the, the, really the paths forward. So starting from the left, we have shelter in place, stay and defend. A very high hazard potential. You know, we're trying. This is where we would want to make uh, structures into fire shelters. It's extremely expensive, and we have a lot of science and technology gaps. Which is this is something you're going to see throughout this. But there are some nuances. This is probably one of the most expensive solutions. Uh, evacuate to a nearby fire shelter. Again, we need the standards for the fire shelters. Uh, next option. Evacuate residents along treated arteries. Uh, we don't have all the standards for the clearance around arteries. Um, and it is, I mean, at least conceptually, uh, potentially cheaper than making uh, many, many, many fire shelters. Uh, but it, it's, not in a, it's not dirt cheap because it does require maintenance. And the last one is evacuate uh, uh, to nearby distributed uh, safety zones or TFRAs, depending on uh, exactly how it's structured. But uh, the uh, there are some uh, challenges there too. So let's uh, let's go to the next slide, please. So this is how it gets summarized. Uh, we have the early out, ready, set, go. When we have enough time, uh, we can clean the arteries. This is right now implementable. Uh, there are some access challenges, environmental considerations, and maintenance. And then we have the distributed uh, safety zone system uh, to reduce the exposure, to reduce the travel time, to help people um, get to uh, reduced exposure place. I'm not going to say safe place. Uh, manage those exposures, manage that risk uh, on their way out when there isn't enough time. And uh, th there is a big difference uh, in this uh, events, the zero notification events. And it, you know, if people, I, I want to stress this. I mentioned this at the beginning. We don't want to compare to the ready, set, go, and early out because that's not the comparison. The comparison is 
go somewhere where you can reduce the exposures to prevent people from burning in their cars. Uh, th that's that's the type of environment we want to avoid. We want to avoid those burnovers. So these are a couple of paths forward. Next. <coughs> so if we look at those distributed uh, safety zone systems, um, and I, the, I think that the better term we're going to be using going forward is temporary fire refuge areas. Move the, the word safety away from it because we don't want people to think that that's a place they should go if they don't want to evacuate when they're told to evacuate. That's very important uh, to mention. Currently, we have no standards, uh, location and placement considerations. Um, we want to leverage existing um, things like sports fields, parking lots, gravel areas, um, golf courses, those types of things. Uh, we have some sizing information that we can use um, from NWCG. Uh, distributed is the key. Uh, because getting to those areas, as we've seen in the camp, can be very, very, very problematic uh, when we're talking about a zero notification event. Next. And this is, the, the, this is again, uh, the, ish, the um, example from um, Concow. As, as the crow flies, people you know, traveling two kilometers, a little over a mile, uh, uh, went through multiple burnovers. So <clears throat> the least uh, amount of travel is having the, the uh, TFRA, Temporary Fire Refuge Area, uh, literally next to the residence. You can think of it that way, an open space. Um, and uh, the worst case is, you know, if you think of it, uh, you know, the most travel, having the area on the, put on the other side of the community or on the other side of town, which really challenges uh, people with uh, travel, uh, creates uh, traffic situations and it increases exposure. So the, uh, the shorter the travel, uh, the better all other things being equal. Next. So proposed implementation, I'm gonna move through this pretty quickly so that we have a few minutes for um, questions. So the idea here is we wanna create this uh, trigger zones uh, around communities and use the equation we gave you before uh, that we're gonna revisit to help you make the decisions for when to pull the trigger. And in the implementation, there is also guidance on how to utilize data during the incident to help you reassess and potentially make adjustments. Um, and uh, the trigger zones uh, are gonna be scenario, you know, the areas, you can think of them as, uh, they're not donuts, but there are this uh, uh, donut-like shapes around your community are going to be influenced by a number of things. But the uh, brown, green, red, purple uh, sequence uh, helps you understand where this fits in in the context of ITA, ignition to activation, and um, evacuation time. Uh, so let's let's run through this. Let's go to the next slide and run through this uh, to get uh, some perspective. You remember the um, um, ITA and ET numbers that um, uh, we uh, talked about earlier in the presentation. So 20 minutes for ignition to activation made up, obviously, and uh, I'm in an hour 40 minutes for the evacuation. So you put those two numbers together. And this tells us from ignition, you need a minimum of two hours to get people out or 98% of the people out. If a fire travels at four miles an hour and at the camp we saw a value is even greater than that, four to five uh, was very um, uh, widespread. Uh, you are looking at an ignition eight miles out. And that's, that's really what, uh, and the, the table is very simple, but it helps make the case to people that those very far ignitions is, are not, should not be discounted because of the space, because it takes so long for this whole system to take, um, uh, to come together. So uh, not to be a dead horse, but I encourage you to implement uh, drills to measure ITA and drills for evacuation time. Modeling is not a substitute for the drills. Modeling can augment 
but we need the drills and evacuation time drills have to be complete community evacuation. If you do a partial community evacuation, you're going to get very biased data. It will not tell you about gridlocking. It will not tell you about many of the issues that we spotted in paradise. Uh, next. So this is how now it all comes together. We have the evacuation decisions, and those are fed by the fire evacuation and trigger zones, fire evacuation trigger zones, and the available versus required evacuation time. So if you need two hours and you know that the fire is already an hour and a half away, you know you're not going to have enough time to get people out safely, and you might end up in burnovers. Depending on the situation, you may consider some partial evacuation or you may want to go to TFRAs. The methodology allows you to look at those um, decisions and uh, do the pre-planning, get the data, get the timing information so that during the event, everyone is on the same page because things happen very, very quickly and the public is prepared and knows what to expect. Next. So here is a cartoon, but to give you, you know, what we call the first level and second level assessment. So here uh, on the left, we have a situation of flat ground. There's an ignition. Part of the community is impacted. Uh, and uh, it's pretty clear to see uh, the difference. So if we go to, to the right, and now we dive in and we look a little bit more at how these events can unfold, you can see on the upper left, if the single egress artery is um, at the bottom to the south and the wind comes from the left, uh, the upper part of the community, you're going to want to shelter in community uh, because you won't be able to drive through. Uh, similarly, uh, with uh, the case on the upper right, on the upper, on the lower left, uh, on flat ground, this is a case where the people at the top in the gray area could easily get out. However, if you take that same scenario and you put it on a slope, um, this could be a situation where you tell people to get out and the fire comes from behind them uh, and overtakes them as they're uh, leaving uh, on the way up the hill. And this is, again, it's a cartoon, but just to illustrate that it is very complex and there are so many scenarios we have to uh, at least have a high level understanding of how to deal with them and inform the public about it's a very you know you can think of it as very binary uh, early out or uh, shelter to limit uh, those high exposure burnover uh, conditions next so I'm going to just breeze through uh, the uh, assessment, planning, and execution. There's a whole section in the report here. Um, we we're giving you um, the appendix C from this technical note 2135. That is the uh, Camp 3 fire progression timeline. Uh, we want uh, to uh, get the uh, data on the ignition to activation and evacuation time to to compute your uh, ignition to safety, to calculate your ignition to safety numbers. Um, look at your critical infrastructure and your fire uh, suppression capabilities. Uh, next. So um, data gathering is an important component and there's a whole bunch of stuff here. Uh, the WE uh, Community Hazard Framework, uh, which came out of Camp 3 and is in the uh, state um, I think chapter 49, appendix P, if I remember correctly, um, allows you to take a whole bunch of the community data and put it uh, in one spot so that you can easily see uh, all these different uh, data layers, including uh, where your uh, safety zones or TFRAs are, access to them, evacuation destination locations, hardening of critical infrastructure, the conditions of your evacuation arteries, previous evacuation data, and so on and so forth. Uh, next, and this is a snapshot of the Appendix C. And this is available online, uh, of course, um, to uh, download as part of uh, Camp 3, but also independently. Uh, and the, there isn't a lot of uh, 
hopefully new stuff. But the idea here is to put it all in one place. And that typically doesn't happen. It's a good way uh, to keep everything together. Um, and also some of this data will be useful to first responders dur during, res during the event as well. Um, so making the data available to them before the event and making some of this information available to mutual aid will also be extremely useful. Next. So um, in terms of planning, uh, developing the community notification plan, then we also want to uh, identify the grid red zone threshold for the trigger points, uh, evacuate the, uh, develop the evacuation scenarios, uh, and that includes the TFRAs, identify purple zones. The purple is uh, situations where only partially the community is impacted. And then uh, uh, be mindful about how you account for uncertainties uh, and uh, developing safety factors in all your decision making. You know, if, you, if you run your drill on the best case situation and takes an hour and 40, is this really the number you want to be using for your trigger point? Uh, do you want to factor in nighttime? Do you want to factor in some other considerations that may delay um, uh, your evacuation? And that that doesn't include um, the fire jump, you know, spotting ahead and closing arteries. Uh, so all this needs to be factored in, and we talk about all of this in 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 the plan. Uh, next, we're wrapping up here. Execution. There is a lot in the pre-fire planning and, and normal operations. Uh, including training and PPE and maintenance. Uh, one thing I do want to point out here, uh, I'm not going to read through all of them, is uh, it is very important to have a really a good connection with the public uh, in terms of uh, their expectation of where they want to go to get the most up-to-date information on evacuation. Uh, the flip side of this is you have to be able to guarantee that you can maintain that communication line open during evacuation. Um, because if you keep sending people to one area, uh, to one spot, and uh, you cannot maintain it, then that causes a discontinuity in the communication. Uh, so that is an important uh, consideration that we have seen. Next. So um, in terms of execution, uh, during those uh, high hazard conditions, uh, you know, you monitor the situations and um, you communicate with your with surrounding AHJs um, and make sure that everyone is on the same page in terms of potential fire spread, direction of the wind, and so on and so forth. Uh, and uh, with your drills, you're going to have uh, the, AH, the surrounding AHJs and jurisdictions participating. And that is, as we saw in Paradise, absolutely essential. Uh, next. During the fire, monitor the situation, use uh, situational awareness to help you um, bound the fire spread and see where that fits in with your plan to see if you need to potentially move your thresholds further out and accelerate the decision to pull the trigger. Because of, you know, if you made your estimates as an example at three mile per hour fire spread and you're seeing five or six, you know that you're going to need to move those. Uh, trigger zone thresholds uh, way further out. Uh, next, I'm really summarizing here. Uh, <laughs> I'm just giving you tidbits, high level stuff. I encourage you to read the 100 page report. Uh, there's only so much I can share with you in the, in the 40, in the, in the, you know, 60, 70 minutes. So <laughs> this is how it all comes together with the evacuation triangle. This is how we're wrapping up now. Um, we look at the fire, we look at the location of the fire, and this all, there's nothing new here, but it's how it ties in together. You look at the available time, and then you make the decision based on the knowledge you have from your drills. That is an absolutely essential part. Um, do the drills, see how long it actually takes. And you can do mock drills uh, and propagate that information through your system, see how long it takes. Uh, the fire containment is obviously a, a component here in, in the uh, uh, decision making. So that kind of ties the story together. Um, so let's uh, go to recommendations, I think, next. Uh, so understand the relationship between fire spread, 
and the duration of wind events. And this is uh, important uh, to help us uh, impact evacuation projections in the future, uh, understand the relationship between wind events and effectiveness of initial containment. This is something I mentioned at the very beginning. Uh, we want to look at, want to do a study of that uh, um, in that area. Um, and there are a number of models out there, but there is no method to assess their performance. So we're going to be working on that with a number of partners. And uh, I do want to mention one thing uh, that uh, many of you may have implemented, uh, but uh, it's um, something to put out. Uh, social to like remote work uh, during high hazard weather events uh, may be beneficial uh, in certain conditions uh, because then people won't have to you know, potentially go back to get their kids from school, creating further traffic jams in the community before they get out. So the, there are some things that are easy. This is one of them that has come up and we wanted to share that uh, with you. So let's go to the summary. Next. So um, I gave you the, the uh, you know, the, a, a lot of bits and pieces. I really encourage you to read the whole report. There's just so much information. And this is the summary of the thousand pages of the campfire. So uh, I can uh, we can only simplify it so much for the presentation, but I hope you get a sense of the challenges that come with evacuations and some of the lessons that we have learned uh, from the camp. Um, this, these don't apply everywhere. Uh, and we want you to really study escape. Uh, we'll, we'll make some more tools available to you uh, in the next six months. Uh, and we really want you to practice. Uh, put systems in place and really practice. Uh, the uh, training exercise that Paradise did with full fire mocking, mock up and evacuation with mutual aid, including air support, uh, I think close to 200 people involved first responders really build muscle memory and had dramatic positive impact on the whole event, specifically in terms of the evacuation. So it's a complex problem, but we have tried to create a system, uh, a simplified system uh, that can help small and intermediate sized communities get their hands around how to deal with this extremely complicated event in a methodical way using actual data. And I will really want to stress that, actual data. So that's all I'm going to say for now. Uh, next slide, I think, has my confirmation. And um, Becky, back to you, and let's uh, start with some questions. Thank you so Thank much, you. Alex. I appreciate, um, again, all the time that you've taken with our group today. I know there was a lot of information that you shared, and. Um, I do want to point out that in the chat, I put the link for some of the NIST guidance, including the campfire studies and the escape report in the chat. Um, I also put a link, although it's not, it doesn't have a lot of information in it yet, but a link to the WUI fire days, which are coming up next month. Yes. Um, the, the agenda isn't up yet. Do you know if that's coming up? Uh, uh, Becky, uh, I'm going to make sure I email you the agenda here um, uh, as soon as we're done. And then you okay. can share it with uh, with the group. Okay. Uh, the agenda great. is online, but the agenda is available. We'll share it with you, and we encourage all of you to participate. There is no registration, and it's free. Okay, great. Thank you. And so, um, so to everyone else on the call, I will also include the links as well as some other tools that Alex has sent my way um, over the last few weeks in a follow up email. Um, you'll get a copy of this presentation as well as Alex, um, it, will it be okay if I send them the PDF of the PowerPoint as well? Uh, absolutely, yes. Okay, so so those of you that were asking for the PowerPoint, we'll make sure to include that in the follow-up email. Um, let me stop sharing. Hopefully everybody got your contact information here. Um, do we have any questions from the group that haven't maybe already been answered? I know it was a lot of information. I'm hoping it is Alex, a lot. <laughs> Alex, is there an app for all of this yet? Well, we're working on that, uh, <laughs> it, but it is a lot. Uh, and uh, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create essentially an interactive uh, web-based tool 
uh, so that uh, it's going to be geared not to the homeowners, but to AHJs uh, to help them understand how all of this fits together. Uh, and uh, ultimately, yeah, we're working towards an app, but it's it's a lot. <laughs> While we're trying to complete the campfire. <laughs> so we're very, uh, yeah, uh, we'll try and get all these things out to you as quickly as we can. Okay. I have a few questions, but if anybody else has them first, go ahead and raise your hands and I'll be happy to pass the mic over. Um, for, I, I want to say, for those of you that were in our last call, our presenter, um, one of the questions that was asked was how they felt about drills. And I think our question about that is answered um, multiple times in today's presentation. So we definitely see the value of those. Um, I did want to ask Alex, and I, you've already said you don't have a lot of information to share about this yet, but is there anything you can share about the work that's being done on the social component and the education? Is there any particular organization leading that up? Let, let, let me say two things. Um, let, let me uh, just stress uh, one more time uh, the, the value of the drills. Uh, and uh, I think it is when we, uh, I'm going to take one step back and say that we are seeing, I think, uh, unequivocally that uh, 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 fire behavior is getting more and more aggressive. So we need to be very mindful not to only look back when thinking of fire and thinking of evacuations, because we can end up pigeonholing ourselves and saying, oh, like in paradise, oh, the fire will never jump the river. It hasn't jumped the river in 100 years. It'll never jump the river. We're never going to need a full evacuation. So we really need to be very mindful about creating uh, realistic expectations that might be beyond what has happened historically and look at the community in that lens. And if you look at the community in that lens and you realize I may have to evacuate my entire community, doing a partial drill will not get you there. I want to stress this because you do a partial drill, you evacuate two zones, you're like, oh, great. Yeah, we have road capacity. We have everything. You evacuate, you evacuate everyone, everything gridlocks, and it changes. We had in paradise gridlock in Chico 10 miles out, backing up all the way into town, causing people to be in burnovers because there was a bottleneck for 10 miles. So it's not just getting people out. You have to know where you're going to put all those people. And you may, I shouldn't say may, you will have to work very closely with your surrounding happen you uh, so the drills i cannot stress this enough uh, the second part with respect to the social aspect um, i cannot point you to anything um, concrete at this time but i can tell you what we're doing uh, we have a national effort that we have just started with the u.s fire administration um, it started about a month ago, uh, and uh, we have three things I can, uh, I can share with you. Um, the short-term goal, so by spring, we want to have a TFRA signage guidance document, you know, template uh, for communities to use to mark their temporary fire refuge areas, and a fact sheet for TFRAs. Uh, the fact sheet on the front end is going to be um, pointing to the homeowners so they understand, to the residents, so they understand what TFRAs are for and what they're not for. And the backside is going to be for the decision makers, for HJs, to help them with the planning and the sizing and the placement and the constraints associated with TFRAs. So that's the short-term stuff. We want to have both of these things out by spring. And then over the next year and a half, we're undertaking a much longer term effort with a specific focus on communication, both to the first responders and to the public as part of a national campaign. Because when we tell people to go, we need to make sure they know where to go. If it is to go out of 